Well, hello everybody, Pastor Andy here. Welcome to this teaching, this special edition teaching that we're doing on the book of Revelation, in particular, the seven letters to the church. I, I feel impressed upon my heart. Uh, several weeks ago, I had some quiet time and I was rereading uh, the book of Revelation, but I never made it past chapter two and three. Now, that's not because I'm not interested or because of somehow I think I know everything because I don't by any stretch of the means. But I felt like the message that we need to hear right now is not the gloom and doom stuff, not the scary stuff, because those things have been have been told they're coming, you know, but how that affects us all depends on where we have placed our faith and trust, because if we've placed our faith and trust in the Lord, we're going to be OK. And so that's really not that's really not the issue. The issue that I feel like needs to be addressed uh, is to the church. I say this as a pastor. I say this as a follower of Christ, because as we look at these letters, we've looked at two. We've looked at Ephesus and Smyrna, two very different messages to both. But they all start in the beginning. In it, everything does. Right. And so. When we look at, there's two in the beginnings in the Bible, all right? We have Genesis 1 in the beginning where God created, but we have John chapter 1 where the Word of God is spoken. And so we see, we see how those two things tie to this because of the one who is speaking. And in particular in the lesson today, as we look at the church of Pergamum, um, what is the message here? All right, so we're looking at the, the two churches so far, and how we get to the ultimate end is indeed based on the beginning, leaving our first love, leaving being the voluntary action, leaving being the I'm walking away because I believe I've either convinced myself or I've been convinced I can find something better. And so we see that this is being addressed, all right? As we as we move the needle little by little, we go from Ephesus to Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna, he he's giving them much more of a um, much more of a of a confirmation about where they were, and and that he's never going to leave. That he's that he's always there. He says, I can I can see what you're going through, but if you hold on. If you hold on, it's not going to be easy. And I'm not telling you that it's going to be easy. But if you hold on, it says in the very last line of, of chapter uh, 2, verse 11, Christ conquerors, that is conquerors through Christ, are safe from the devil's death. What is the devil's death? Perish. Gone forever. Never to be seen again never to be heard from again, erased, done, finished, over. Christ conquerors are safe from that. Very important that we understand that because multiple times throughout Scripture, we see John 3.16, if you believe, you should not perish. God's desire is that none should perish. There's a, there's a reason that that word is used. And, uh, and we'll talk about that in another lesson. But I want to move on into Pergamum. It says this beginning in verse 12, write this to Pergamum, to the angel of the church, as each letter is addressed this way to the specific place, to the specific person. Why? Because that is the proclaimer of the message. That is the pastor. That is the one that has been given the ability to share this word with those that are listening. He says the one and so, as, as we, again, not to be repetitive, but we go back and we look. Okay, we see in chapter uh, 2 and verse 1, as we start in the letter to Ephesus, the one with the seven stars. Okay, and then we see in verse 8, the beginning and the end, the first and the final one. Now we see where this word is coming from, the one with the sharp, biting sword. When we look to Paul's letter in Ephesians chapter 6, we hear about the full armor of God. And he says the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. What is the Word of God? Or should I say, who 
is the Word of God. Because that's the real answer, friends. Once we understand that, it changes everything. It is the words that proclaim, that, pour, that come forth, that are, are given to us from the mouth of Christ himself. And so we see here the one with the sharp biting sword. Okay, so the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Draws from the sheath of where? His mouth. So we see here what he is saying. He's saying it's coming directly from me. Directly from me. So we don't have any confusion here as to where this message is coming from. And he says, and out come the sword words. In other words, they're going to be sharp. They're going to be real. They're going to cut to the bone. Now, some, some lean more toward the... Um, the ugly side of that, but that's not really what it is. It's just the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts because we don't like it because it requires change or it requires correction or, 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 or it requires admitting that I was wrong. Who likes to do that? Nobody wants to say that, right? So we see here in the very first part of this in verse 12, chapter 2 and verse 12, to this letter, to the church at Pergamum, to the angel of that church that is going to give forth this message, the word is coming directly, as the other two letters have, we see the continual pattern directly from the Lord himself. Now, verse 13, I see where you live. Now, that, that ought to cause a little pause, all right, right there, right to start off with. I see where you are. Does that matter today? Absolutely, friends. Absolutely. Because we have to understand, he is not just merely speaking to an individual, okay? He is speaking to the church, to the body of Christ, to those who say and claim that they represent him, whether it's through a name, whether it's through an organization, whether it's through a denomination, whatever, it doesn't matter. He's saying, if you say that you represent me, I see where you are. I see where you are. That could be good and bad, all right? We see that in Smyrna, he says, I, I see your pain and your poverty. I see your constant pain, your dire poverty. I, I know the things that you're struggling with. I, I'm there. I understand it. Here he's saying, I see where you live. Right under the shadow of Satan's throne. What is that speaking about, all right? What cast a shadow? Things that prevent the light. Something that is hindering the light, something that is is, is shadowing, if you will, we, we use that word here, something that is, is trying to hinder the light from getting through, therefore it casts, it casts a shadow. He says, but, and the, the, there, again, oftentimes when I'm teaching, I really like to focus in on the, on the simplistic words that we use all the time, all right, but always changes the conversation. Always, all right, whether for the positive or the negative, but it always changes the conversation when you use it in that context. So he says, I see where you live, right under the shadow of Satan's throne. So I see that he's trying to keep the light from getting in. I realize the struggle that you're dealing with, but, all right, so this is a positive one. You continue boldly in my name. So regardless of the the hindrances and the different things that come about just trying to keep the light out, you keep going. I'm in your corner all the way with that. That, that is a good thing. That is a positive thing. That is a, 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 that is a compliment or, or you know, any, all the different positive words that we can think of, okay? And sometimes words escape me because I get, when, I, when I'm really teaching and, I, and my heart is just, just so deep into sometimes I, I I, I, I'm, I'm guilty I'm of human, right? And so, so we see here, he said, but you have continued boldly in my name. Never once have you denied my name. So you stayed true to the faith. You've stayed true to me, even when the pressure was worst. When all the heat was coming down. It says, when they martyred Antipas, my witness, who stayed faithful to me on Satan's turf. Where is that? The earth. So he's saying, even when you've seen one of your own lose their life, you stayed faithful. You, you didn't deny me. 
you didn't walk out the door, you didn't close the door, you didn't shut, you know, shut down the, 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 the facility, you didn't stop meeting, you kept on. For that I commend you. I am standing firm in your corner. Here's where the tide changes. And again, we see but. And this is so applicable right now. So as I stated in the first lesson about how some, some want to look at this as time periods in the sense of it, it's just only one section here, one section there, and it, and it, and it only is only associated with a particular time frame. Well, as we go through this, we see that's not true. That's not true at all because this is applicable right now. And the result of this, how this came to be, is from the first letter. You left your first love. Because if I'm not strong in that, which causes me to be strong in my faith, then I could easily be swayed to something else. Okay, so you've, you've stayed strong in, in, in the fact that you've not denied me. You've stand, you stand firm on who I am and what you believe. But in verse 14, we see it says, but why do you indulge the Balaam crowd? Hmm. So he's asking them, okay, if you really believe, and I see that you do, why would you allow any compromise? Why would you allow anything to come in and possibly sway someone? Why would you allow that in your door? Why would you allow that in your practices and in your worship? It tells us if we study a little history, okay, because I, I want to be correct and I want to be accurate in what we're giving here in this particular teaching. What do the letters of Revelation say? All right, so I did a little study. I want to share this with you. This is important to understand. All right, so he says, why do you indulge the Balaam crowd? For those of you that aren't familiar with who that is, it's an Old Testament character that he was asked by Balak. All right, so he asked this prophet named Balaam to curse the Israelites. But the Lord spoke to Balaam and said, don't do that. Don't do that. And so Balaam blessed them instead of cursing them, right? But later, but later he would go back, he would disobey God, and he would teach this original one, this Balak, to, to tempt and, and, and to, to cause roadblocks and stumbling blocks to the Israelites in order to get them to commit a sin. In other words, we'll read. It says, don't you remember that Balaam was an enemy agent? In other words, he, he played both sides and seduced Balak and sabotaged Israel's holy pilgrimage by throwing unholy parties. In other words, he put things, he, he, showed, he showed this Balak, if you, want, if you want them to have problems, I'll show you how to make it happen. We will create enticements. We will create temptations to draw them away because humans are susceptible to temptation. The word enticement here, enticement to commit sin. All right, so... What does, that, what does that look like? So what he's saying here is, in this letter, why do you indulge that? In other words, why would you allow anything, anything in, in your teaching, anything in your worship, anything in your proclamation of me, why would you allow anything that could possibly cause someone to go in a different direction? Why is that important? Because we are inundated today, friends, with a multitude of different kinds of teachings, okay? And few, and few marry together. Very few, all right? You have so many different doctrinal boundaries, and you have a multitude of different Bible versions and doctrines and belief systems, all under the same banner. I mean, it, it is known, at least from a, a registered or, or, or proclaimed uh, name situation, of at least 44,000, you heard that number right, 44,000 denominations around the world, all under the banner of Christian. 
all under that same banner, but yet still, if we begin to look at them, not just from a personal preference thing, okay, that, that's not what this is, not from a personal preference thing, not from a, not from a, well, I, I like the music a little quieter, or I like it a little louder, or I like it a little more excited, or, or I, like, I like to be dressed up, or I like to dress, we're not talking about cosmetics, okay, th th those, are, th those are insignificant as far as, the, as far as our faith is concerned. But enticement, enticement to veer off. Okay, that is when we begin to, uh, to create walls. That is when things begin to create lines. In other words, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm going to make it and you're not. And, and, and we begin to shun and we begin to say, you know, it, 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 it's a problem. Okay, if we, if we draw and are drawn away, we go back to his sharp biting words. If we're drawn away into something that causes me to either compromise my faith well, again, because we have we have this is called progressive movement now, all right? And so, well, what used to be not okay is okay now. The problem with that is we go back to Malachi and it says, I am God and I do not change. What does that mean? That means that if God said no, at any point in time in history, from creation to right now, five minutes ago, it's still no. Same way with if it's yes. Same way with if it's wait. Whatever the answer is, remains the same. But for those that are in this progressive movement or those that are in all these different, you know, factions and whatever of today saying, well, what once was not okay is okay now. Okay, we see the subject of marriage at the center of that. We see the subject of life at the center of that. We see the subject of you know, all these different things that begin to be problematic. All right. And so the Lord here is saying, why do you indulge that? Why do you put up with that? Because again, I don't change. And if I've told you no from the onset, it's still no. You know, it's still one man and one woman. It's still life is, is, is precious. It's still, you know, all these different things. Love God, love one another. None of these things have changed. But yet still we see a continual and as we see in this very book, don't add to it, don't take away from it. But we see that happening all the time. And so the Balaam crowd is very much one that is saying, oh, yeah, it's okay now. But did God say it was okay? God didn't change. We go back to in the beginning. Okay, in the beginning. The, enemies comes along, the enemy comes along and says, oh, God didn't say you were going to die. It's going to be okay. Go ahead. Just this one time will be great. The Lord here is saying, why do you allow that? Why do you allow that? I didn't change. Why are you allowing that? He says that, that he came along and, and seduced and sabotaged, create, causing them to throw unholy parties. Why do you put up with the Nicolaitans who do the same thing? We talked about the Nicolaitans from the letter in Ephesus, all right? So let's, let's finish up just a couple little history things here. The word Balaam, all right? So he says Balaam's crowd. That word, okay, the name, if you will, it means one who makes a profession for the sake of gain. Okay, why is that tied to the Nicolaitans? Because that's exactly what they did. And we see in Ephesus, he said, you hate that, and so do I. Because they claim that they follow, but they live contrary to his teachings. Do we see how that could be an enticement? Do we see how that can be problematic? Because, well, wait a minute. I mean, they go to church and, and, and they, 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 they do this and they do that. But man, look at how they, they, can, they do everything. They can do everything. That's a choice. Anybody can do anything. Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. There's where the difference is, right? And so while we may see a lot of things happening under the banner of church, there was a big controversy, okay, some probably a couple of months ago, all right, at a men's conference, all right, very well-known pastor was uh, came out to speak and, and, and left and was asked to leave because he spoke out against something that had taken place, okay? Now, what had taken place? There was entertainment there, all right? And I don't understand this, and I don't say this to be uh, crass or anything else, but the entertainment was a half-dressed man swinging around on a pole. Now, I'm 55 years old. 
there has never been a point in time in my life I'd want to see that whether I was saved or not saved, okay? If I'm at a Bible conference, a men's conference to learn more about Jesus, grow in my faith, I don't want to see that. But yet still it was considered entertainment, all right? And the person performing that is, is a person from an alternative lifestyle, a person that has nothing to do with the Lord, okay? Uh, but it was entertaining. And there's been a big conflict about that. This is exactly what he's talking about, why you've allowed that stuff. You've, you've, you've done so good. You've stood firm. Even in the shadow of Satan's throne, you've stood firm. You've watched people be martyred. You've watched people lose their life or their faith, and you've stood firm. But yet still, you're allowing that. And what is going to happen in that, what is going to happen in that is people are going to be compromised. People are going to be pulled away. And oftentimes what happens when one is pulled away, they find it very hard to come back. It's like one in the grips of addiction. It, 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 it pleases the flesh. If we go back to Genesis, it was pleasing to the eye. So therefore, how could it be wrong? It's something I enjoy. It's something I like. It's something that's good to look at. And, and those things, we can use a multitude of examples as to how that, da how that can be dangerous. And it can be everything from food to, 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 to dirty pictures. It doesn't matter, okay? And it, it can be lust, all, all these different things, power. We see, we see struggles for all of these things today. And within the church, here, here's the warning to the church, and this is why this letter is important. He's saying, you've got it right. Your foundation is great, but you're going to crack that foundation and you're going to remove that foundation, and you're going to cause that foundation to fall if you keep that door open. I taught a lesson, and I've probably mentioned it, but not in this lesson, but in many, many of my other video teachings. I taught a lesson several years ago, um, probably one that needs to be pulled back out of the archives sometime along the way. And the title of the message was Never Give the Devil a Ride because he'll always end up driving. See, all he needs is an opportunity, friends. I grew up, I grew up on a farm. All right, and so when they would harvest the crops in the fall, you had to really, really be careful at your home, all right? And it had nothing to do with whether your home was clean or dirty or any of those kind of stuff. It was about the elements. And when they would, when they would harvest, those farm, harvest those crops, the field mice would run. Where would they run to? Place of shelter, place of safety, all right? Because it was scary. This big thing is coming, combine, whatever the case and oftentimes where they would find shelter is in your house, all right? Wasn't because anything there was filthy or anything was drawing them. They were looking for a safe place to be. How would they get in? One say, well, I got the windows sealed and then the doors are sealed. All they need is a little tiny crack and they can find a way to collapse their body and get in in some of the smallest spaces you could ever even possibly imagine. You don't have to have the door open or the windows open. They find a way. This is the same way with the enemy. If we leave a window cracked, or if we have a small, small fracture in something, just like he's saying here, why do you allow that? If we have that small fracture in that, he's coming, okay? And he will find a way in. And, 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 and before long, what was a, a minor, minor fracture in a beam, all of a sudden now is a gaping hole. And nothing is being done to repair that. In fact, it's being encouraged to get a little bit bigger and a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. And before long, your foundation and your subfloor and thing is rotten. And then it's no longer safe to stand on. And before long, if you stand on it, you'll fall through it and you get hurt. You may lose your life. All these different bad illustrations, but that's what this, and he's saying, what you're doing you're right on what you believe about me, but you're not right about what you're allowing in. And what you're allowing in is going to compromise what you believe if you don't do something about it. So he says this in verse 16, enough, enough. Do not give in to them. I will be with you soon. I'm fed up and about to cut them to pieces with my sword sharp words. So he's saying to those that are compromising, to those that are allowing this, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Now he doesn't say when, because we're not getting into the day setting stuff. He just says, I'm on the way. So that, that was a clear warning. That was a warning. Just like he said, Ephesus, turn back. 
You can come home. You can get this straight. Or I'm going to remove you from the golden circle. You can still be there, but you won't be with me. This is what he's telling Pergamum. Cut it out. Cut it out. Get that stuff out of here. Don't allow it. That is why the, the purity of understanding what Jesus said, not what anybody else said. What did he say? What did he proclaim? Because he is the word of God. All right, so what did he give us? He gives us the truth. And that is what he said. I'm coming not with fire and brimstone and lightning. No, he said, I'm coming with the truth. And you can't stand under it because if I call you on why are you allowing this and I show you what you know that I allow, you can't, you won't measure up. It won't work. And you know that. And so the, the, the Balaam crowd, the Nicolaitans, again, none of it was real. It was all, it was all double-sided. And we see that kind of stuff in the world all the time. Okay. The enticement of, oh yeah, this is great. All the time, the one saying that, knowing that it's not. Go ahead, go ahead and, and, and pet the bear. He won't hurt you. All the time knowing that that bear is going to rip your arm off. Okay? We see these charlatans all over the place. Send me, send me your money. God's going to buy you a house. And that poor person that believes that, they send them their last $58. And they laugh all the way to the bank. And that poor old soul is sitting there waiting for that Social Security check to come in to help them survive for the rest of the month because somebody lied to them lied to them. This is what he's saying. Don't entice people to be drawn away from me. Clear, clear message here. He says, are your ears awake? Same way all these letters end. Then listen. Because I'm telling you and I'm giving you the fact. I'm giving you the truth. I'm giving you the word. So he says, listen. Listen to the wind words. That's the Holy Spirit coming through. The Spirit blowing through the churches. That is when it's allowed. When the Spirit of God is allowed to operate. When the, when, when the, when the Spirit of God is allowed to be the helper and the comforter and come in and be in our midst. He says, then you'll know and you'll hear. He says, I'll give sacred manna. I'll give you your nourishment, your survival. I will take care of you even in those difficult moments. Even as you're in the shadow of Satan's throne, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. I'll give you sacred manna to every conqueror. Okay, in the letter to Smyrna, he said Christ conquerors. In the letter to Ephesus, those who come back. So we see a continual theme here. He didn't say everybody. He says, to the conqueror, to the one who endures, to the one who holds on, to the one who goes forward. He said, I will give you sacred manna. I will take care of you. I will give you a clear, smooth stone inscribed with your new name, your secret new name. It will be clear that you are mine. Man. There's so much great stuff in this. I hope you enjoyed these lessons, friends. We're going to be going through all seven letters to the churches, and they're all important, and they matter right now. God bless you. Lord willing, I'll bring you another lesson from Revelation later on this week.